what's been sort of like uh, the, uh, the the more the, the more recent Oppenheimer analysis uh, case where it's like here's a band that you've really like reignited the career. I mean, I guess a lot of I these would can, say, can be said um, for from a lot. France in Adrien Vale. Okay. Yeah, he's from Lyon, and he uh, he recorded a lot of a whole range of material from like punk. I mean, he started out in a punk band, cool. and then he's he was uh, building his own electronics and started doing pretty much what were techno tracks in uh, 1987. He's a really interesting case. I mean, you played that uh, that ultra bass record last night, but yeah, th there's yeah. also like that cover of Money that he did, which is uh, yeah. very different than like the techno thing. But um, which I, I guess kind of brings up a funny thing about Marie, what you and I were speaking about yesterday, this, this kind of like uh, cross section between techno community and, uh, and like kind of new wave kind of stuff going on right now. Yeah, and like the noise community also. Yeah, yeah especially in Montreal. Yeah, you can really feel it in Montreal. Yeah. All the like harsh noise and experimental droney <coughs> people got into techno and I think it's making really great stuff. Like all the knights from the neuro neuromodulation mm -hmm. guys are a good example of mm -hmm. that crossing like that yeah, those sure. those scenes for sure mm -hmm. yeah i mean like uh i think uh, i was talking to justin yesterday you know he wants to book powell and yeah pa yeah yeah powell is like a very good example of someone who uh you know bridges the gap between techno scene and experimental and i mean it's it's very interesting to me because all this music is kind of informing more interesting types of techno and i guess more minimalist music but it's, uh, I guess, the inflection. I mean, I hear it in your music too, Marie, where it's like, you know, it is it is techno in, in a way. You know, there's... Mm -hmm. uh, the new tracks are definitely yeah, yeah. Uh, more dance floor oriented. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, there's some like EBM vibes. There's still, to me, there's still... It's, when I make music, I try to just listen to the sounds and not think about the styles, but there's definitely... Techno is a major influence for me, although mm -hmm. I don't do techno. I don't call myself a techno artist because I don't think I am, mm. but I have so much respect and uh, I, lately that's all the best lives I've seen are techno acts. So I got to travel a lot and spending time in Germany was for sure very inspiring. But to me, it's like Italo Disco is a huge influence also. Right. I, my, I had the chance to play with uh, Daniel Marozo last year and we, we became friends and I think his work is also a really good example of like he synthesized a lot of different styles but he makes his own style. Yeah, for he's, sure. For me, he's like one of the best. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely like that RP vibe. It's like dance music but it, it's it got like so much, so much like connections to yeah. diverse style yeah. of dance music. I try to do the same. The album versions are way more like, like the last albums have been like more ambient and soundtrack, but the next will be more cool. influenced by dance music in general, not only techno. Okay. Would you ever make like a straight up techno record? I maybe if I could. I yeah. don't think yeah. I'm. I, I can yeah. now. I I don't think about those things. Yeah, no, I good. just do music. It's it's funny because you know a lot of people like go into studio being like yeah I'm gonna make a you know a Chicago record right now and that's it just not a good idea it, yeah it just it just doesn't happen because you know it's uh, it's a, it's a mindset it's like it should just flow organically yeah. from you know your fingertips um, integrate your influence yeah exactly and you know just make it unique in yourself um, Veronica I'm I'm curious about your take on um, I guess again this like uh, amalgamation of techno scene and noise scene and all this because I mean. You come from like a quite an extensive background of like uh, punk and post-punk stuff and yeah. hardcore and stuff like that. Like, what's uh, I mean, you've seen the gamut. You know, it's like, uh, w what's your take on? Is this like a very uh, kind of like self-reflexive period, or is this like a, you know, is this just another another phase, or you know, what's is it here to stay? Um, yeah, no, I definitely think it's here to stay because people in techno are now incorporating, it's become the norm to incorporate um, other kinds of 
sounds like uh, post-punk and noise. And uh, they're not afraid of bringing those influences into, you know, onto the dance floor. Yeah. So I think that's actually, um, once that change became acceptable and like people, I mean, I think now people are really embracing that. And um, it's becoming very exciting because be their artists are exploring those areas where they maybe would didn't feel open to exploring before. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I also so. f I, yeah I also find like uh, techno acts are uh, playing a lot more uh, different types of music. It's not just like kind of like straight ahead drummy. Yeah. Yes, you know, like very much like what you were playing last night and what Ron was playing. It's like this nice uh, selection of of uh, you know multiple influences. I guess you could say. And I mean, yeah. I, I I couldn't picture you doing like a just a straight straightforward techno set or something like that. As yeah, me neither. No, never. <laughs> the, uh, but I think that's also because I came from, I mean, doing like very synth-based DJ sets mm -hmm. where, I mean, I would do sets where I was just playing seven inches, like obscure seven inches. Right. And I still love to do that. But um, yeah, it's not very dance floor friendly yeah. to do that. Now, <coughs> just kind of speaking to like the... Uh, the obscure sort of, uh, I mean, your collection must be quite uh, extensive as well. I mean, the uh, do you find that the the search for these these artists that you want to reissue is that as exciting or even more exciting than uh, having the actual like t physical tangible thing out there at the end? Is it is it no, the chase? I, no, no, no. I don't think it's more exciting. Oh, it's not okay. I mean, it's, it's actually, it can be frustrating because I'll search for artists for many years before they surface. Right. But as I was telling you earlier with the Japanese artist Tomo Akikawabaya that we're really, we just released, uh, I mean, it's coming to us next week. Um, he was a, an artist based in Japan in the early 80s and he um, self-released quite a few albums. Mm -hmm. And he had a muse. Uh, her, na her name was Reina Anju, and she was uh, she was in YMO's propaganda film, the Yellow Magic Orchestra. And she, uh, anyhow, she was the top model in the eighties. Amazing. And so, as I when I was collecting those records, I just thought, who's this woman? Because there was not much info on whether she was in the band or not. Mm -hmm. And his name Tomo. I mean, it's. It's, it's just, it was all very mysterious. And I had tried to find him for so many years and he was just inaccessible. I mean, I'd contacted a lot of people in Japan and they were, they had no idea. They didn't know about Castle. The label was called Castle Records. Little did I know that it was just like his label that he uh, used to release his own music. And then at some point last year, um, a friend of mine who asked me about what Japanese artists I wanted to release. I said, well, Tomo. And he said, oh, you're still talking about Tomo. It's like seven years later. <laughs> <laughs> and then he found uh, one of the engineers that Tomo worked with. And suddenly we were in contact. I mean, I, through now, he, uh, uh, he acted as our translator. And Tomo was like, well, I'm a huge fan of Minimal Wave, and I've been following it on Facebook. So, so I was like in shock. I was like, okay, this long lost person. I actually, I thought he had passed away. And um, the very iconic imagery of this top model on all his records was just it Those just records added are to beautiful. The, they really I've are. I've seen them. Are you going to use that? lady again like the photos we but yeah we used um one of the images that had never great. been printed oh that's wow that's great for the cover those um, covers are gorgeous yeah, yeah. the music also covers the, are that photographer he uh yeah he's very well known in japan for doing a lot of fashion stuff and I still don't know the relationship between Tomo and Reina. I mean, one of his albums is called Anju, her last name. I know. Yeah. It's very mysterious. And he also, there's a dress, a photograph of a dress that he, um, that she's wearing on one of the records, and we used it in the inside of the gatefold. 
and he had emailed that he, he actually s made that dress. He sewed her dress, which is like, wow. adds to the whole story. Yeah. Um, Some pretty so crazy yeah. mythology there. Yeah. That's really neat. Actually, it's, it's, uh, I'm glad we kind of like started talking about aesthetics because, Murray, I mean, you're, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, French New Wave uh, kind of vibe there, when, like the, cin the cinema kind of thing, and like a lot of, uh, nods to like uh, giallo horror kind of films. I mean, where where does that sort of come from? I'm curious about this. I, I don't know, I've always liked films. I watch a lot of films. When I was a kid, a teen, I would watch films. But I'm also, <coughs> I, I went to uh, school in drama school. I, I wanted to become an actress. Okay. And then I changed my mind because I missed music and I went back to music, but the also there's a a perf performative aspect in my work that is as much as important as the music. That's why the lives ha make so much sense. Like if you wanna understand what I like, know what I do, you have to see it live mm -hmm. because and the for the albums, it's the same. It's not just music; it's a conceptual object. Yeah. I really, really love um, your idea of un autre voyage, as in like another voyage or another trip. That's it. That's what it means yeah. in like in French. Voyage can be a journey, mm -hmm. a trip. Yeah, a trip. I like the, the Ma many yeah. many trips are possible. <laughs> yeah. That's what it means. But the duplicity in it, I like. Uh, you know, you've obviously put some like real thought into like the concept of that. You know, as like yeah, another trip, another voyage. It's like you're. I don't think maybe you would ever just make a track with no sort of like concept. No, like on this album, all the lyrics are based on stuff that happened to me. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I mean, and v for you, Veronica, I mean, how important is um, when you're, I guess for a lot, for th some of the new stuff, how important is um, a strong sense of uh, aesthetic or visual direction? Um, when when someone hands you a demo and says this is me it's not just like a soundcloud link but there's like a, a package of sorts like is that important to you um you mean coming from the artist coming themselves? from the artist yeah yeah no because a lot of times i'm just very inspired by if i hear something i like then i have it's like an automatic uh image that it comes to mind and and then i already i have this concept of that of, of how the album should look or how the okay. and that's where should look. and that's where you take uh, I guess take the lead on your your uh, way of communicating the visual language for the artwork and the direction of it. That's interesting because yeah. I think a lot of labels really work the other way in many respects where they're kind of lazy about it where they want to you know they want someone to just be like here's here's a, a plate with this object you know right. like already uh, already there like to be consumed whereas you you really yeah. want to work uh, like behind the scenes picking apart like how to create I guess yeah I like to collaborate with the artists like yeah. ideally yeah who's um, I mean of the city tracks people who's the uh, the act that you've um, I guess kind of pulled the strings most with like ha have had a quite a hand in the uh, development I guess um, I would say broken English club okay and yeah, and uh, I guess if, if you guys don't know Broken English Club, it's uh, Oliver Ho, uh, Rod Ife. Uh, I'm sure I know Josh. You like uh, hard hard techno, <laughs> and, <laughs> and Matt. Um, so, I mean, coming from his project of uh, you know the Rod Ife project and the Oliver Ho stuff, like you know when he was making this kind of like slower, chuggier stuff, what was your process in kind of like uh, making it all come together? You mean as far as design or? Yeah, design and just like the whole shtick, I guess, of it. Um, well, there isn't really a shtick, yeah. but it's, I think it was a combination of themes that he talked about okay. and it expressed related to his music and then what that made me think of next. So, um, like the the one that we're working on right now that's coming out in November, it's a full-length album of Broken English Club. It's his first 
full album. We've done, um, we did the split release with Silent Servant and then we did a 12 inch of four tracks but um, they haven't fully reflected what he wants to do in music because it's not only about the dance floor with right. him. So there's a lot of quiet, um, very dark, almost more guitar, like post-punk style, right. slow stuff. And for the design, um, he had sent me some images that were kind of like very straightforward fetish, like futuristic, f I don't even know how to explain what like fetishistic combination of, uh, they, they didn't work for me at all. Okay. I just thought, no, but I, I understood what he was going for. Mm -hmm. And so out of that, we ended up, at the time I was really into these uh, Andy Warhol Polaroids. I mean, I still am obsessed with all these series that he, that Warhol did mostly in New York, of people and of uh, still lifes of objects. And so he did a bunch of Polaroids with like knives, he did one with bananas, he did one with telephones, shoes, um, amazing lighting, which is like very straightforward Polaroids. So what we ended up doing was we photographed um, shackles, like animal traps, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. because his album is called Suburban Hunting. Okay. And we photographed them in the way that Warhol would have photographed them. Cool. And so they end up looking, it looks a little S&M or fetish, mm -hmm. but it's actually, um, you know, there are these animal traps. It's hard to explain, you'll have to see the image, but the image came out to be a very powerful image. Cool. And right when I sent it to him, he just thought, yeah, I love this, this is great. That's nice. See, that's that's a direct and direct relationship with your artists in terms of you know guy as I said guiding them. And yeah, and, and then I work with uh, Silent Servant a lot on conceptualizing the art. Okay. So he, um, we were in touch. He lives in L.A. and we're in touch on the phone a lot, talking about these things. And he knows Oliver's music so well. I mean, they're very good friends. Mm -hmm. So he actually. Um, he and his girlfriend had photographed, had done, done the photography. So the whole, it was, it's an interesting collaborative process because it's being informed by, you know, someone who's making kind of similar music. Yeah. And, um, yeah. That's interesting. So you, you brought up an interesting point about, um, you know, a lot of, I mean, a lot of the music that you release is, is conceptual, and Marie, your, your music is very conceptual as well. In this day and age where people say albums are dead, where does that leave room for, uh, for real concept uh, tracks and albums? It's like, is our albums dead? Are they not? Where, how else are we able to, um, I guess, communicate the, the concept of Uno Trovoyage if it's not in an album or something like that? You know, is there, is there ways? Yeah, I think there are definitely ways, yeah. yeah. What's, uh, I mean, what's the next step, I guess, beyond album, like beyond the, you know, double LP, like what's the... Um, to do like a six song EP and then have bonus tracks, like bonus digital tracks. Okay. And you think that, that. that that keeps people's attentions like more focused or... Um, I mean, what works on City Tracks is really the four song EP mm -hmm. because to present a double 12 inch album of music that people don't really know about mm -hmm. is kind of, it's a commitment yeah, totally. to ask them to, <laughs> yeah, totally. to get to buy it. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, it's a risk that I take when I think something's amazing. Like this Japanese album is a double LP. Wow. Okay. Um, and yeah, this year has been a lot about double LPs. Yeah, totally, yeah. The Oppenheimer analysis retrospective we did was... That was a double LP. Yeah. Well. Interesting. N and Marie, when you're approaching um, an album or an EP or something like that, like, is, uh, you know, in, in terms of in terms of the concept, like, obviously, it's, it's much more distilled for something like a three-track EP. Is it less, um, you know, in your, in your brain, is it more just straight ambience is it just or is it kind of free flowing is it something that you're just it was always free flowing for mm -hmm. yeah. the last three the first three albums yeah <coughs> they were all made in state of emergency 
which I'm not anymore. <laughs> I like to put more thought on a longer LP and um, have something more tight. Okay. But I'm re very, I feel good about how I worked before. I had to do it that way. It was new and I, have, I had stuff to say and mm -hmm. I had to put it out there. But I don't know, you ask like, is albums dead? I, I mean, is music dead? <laughs> I mean, mu albums is music. I, to me, it doesn't really matter if someone catch one track on the internet or in a DJ set mm -hmm. from someone else and really enjoys that track and someone else will give thought like, and time yeah. to listen to the whole thing yeah, from totally. beginning to last. I think albums will always have a life, like films, it's like, is cinema dead? No, but cinema has definitely changed. Mm -hmm. Now people watch um, shows, TV shows yeah. on their laptop some people still go to see films yeah. i think it's just nothing is dying it's just changing I think fading yeah. coming back things are coming back record has come back maybe something else will go away come back later yeah, totally. i think, I think it's, the it's information it's just information yeah. out there and people choose what they want yeah i think i think the people that make those kinds of assertions are um you know they're they're very one-dimensional in terms of uh, how they think music is consumed, and I, I don't agree with the, the notion that an al the albums are. Music dead. shouldn't be consumed. <laughs> music I, should I, be I, listened to. For for it's sure. Not food or like yeah, water. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, but this is why. I it's mean, not a thing. It's it's something else. It's always uh, it's always interesting, kind of like getting the journalist aspect of, uh, of you know the commentary, I guess, behind all these all these topics because. You know, at the very core of it, it's just an experience, a very like uh, you know unique experience of you and something you're listening to. But you know, and I think the commentary is interesting sometimes, and it's important that it exists. But um, but it also comes down to economics because sure. it is a lot. It's harder to sell yeah. an album, a full-length album. How have you uh, found it in terms of like, navigating? How I mean, you guys must do pretty good pre-sales and stuff like that to, in order to... Yeah, I mean, we know. do a combination of you know, albums, 12 inches, and LPs. Yeah. I mean, EPs. Um, but I think when it comes down to it, I mean, a 12-inch could be played on the dance floor. And once you have a DJ that's interested in a 12-inch, then you have album sales. Mm -hmm. And those people don't necessarily want to buy, like the Streetwalker record that we did.